Awo, shalom and salam to Tina Yistalin again. Now, we want to continue with a particular reasoning, and this we want to probably call this the, the, the Man Up series. And what we mean by the Man Up series? Well, we hear a lot in society today, especially directed to the black male and um, to, to men in general, but in particular we're concerned with the black male about manning up. And something very interesting in this particular um, study and, and reading that we're in, in First uh, Timothy. In First Timothy chapter, First Timothy chapter 2. And it is continuing the teaching on prayer. And in the Schofield Study Bible, if you notice the subscription, it says, uh, part 2 says prayer and the divine order of the sexes, that there's a divine order of the sexes. Now, if we look in the modern so-called seclorum and world, we're not going to see this divine order um, being, being manifested or being projected or being followed. And this is where we can know spiritually we're in Babylon. Babylon is a confusion. There's a confusion concerning the sexes. There's a confusion concerning what is male and what is female. What are the roles for man and what is the role for woman? So when we hear Babylonians in the world saying man up, and especially to the black male, man up. And, and truthfully, we all as black male, men and males have to consider our situation. But the first and the key thing is, we have to know self, not just the personal individual self, but collectively who we are as a people, because we didn't just get into this, this situation individually. Each of us individually may have different, and we do have different challenges, different natures, so forth and so on. But overall, there is a divine order, and we fell from that divine order and we fell under a curse, and we have come under a spell. This spell, we call it the spell of Willie Lynchism, or the spell of Willie Lynch, or the Willie Lynch spell, the how to make a slave spell. And it's very important to study that document. And we study that document both in a historic context, but moreover, in its social, there's a social application to it, that regardless if one tried to dismiss it and say, oh, Willie Lynch, how to make a slave, that's just there. That makes it, we don't want to look at that because we're in a post-racial society. This is what they were saying after Obama was elected as the first so-called African-American president. Yet the, the post-racial racism is still there. It's still very prevalent in society. Now, Obama put a challenge to us as black males, and this is the, this was the, um, the, the speech that Obama gave that caused, um, or that Jesse Jackson responded to about cutting that nigger's balls off, or something to that effect. And y'all might recall that when Obama was running, you know, for for president and during the campaign. And the speech that Obama gave basically was concerning how black men had to be better fathers and black men had to be better role models and examples and there for their families and so forth and so on. And that's a true message. Even though he only dealt with half the story and half of it, still it is a very important message. Now, our criticism of the president, Obama, is much like Tavis Smiley's criticism and um, Cornel West, who we call these, these uh, two black witnesses. They're like the two witnesses, in a sense, of even a revelation. Um, however, they both are of the correct point of view, not even just an opinion, but point of view that even though Obama has said these things, he has not really recognize that who is being, who is the worst affected, the very so-called backbone or the black bone of America is the worst affected, and this is namely the black people in general, and in particular the black males. But we as black males do have to man up. But to whose standard, 
first of all, to whose standard of manhood or malehood? Whose standard of it is? Do are you saying that the white man is the male, so it's to a a Anglo European or Eurocentric standard of malehood or manhood? In other words, to live in the image of the beast? Or is it to God stand that we have to man up? And in this particular teaching that we've been teaching on right here from um, first the first epistle of uh, Hawari Apollos to uh, Timotewos in chapter 2, there's a particular interesting part here, and this is in verse 8, where it says, I will therefore, Hawari Apollos says, I will therefore, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, we pointed this out in the last part of this um, presentation, Kutera um, Cement Bamarinya, where it says, and then we know, in Gdi, when do hulu ale kutana ale kufua sabiatek adesu tina e jocha yanesu, in the as elu, effect adalo. And breaking it down word by word, in Gdi, therefore, when doch, when doch is to say males. So, what is interesting about this, to, to recognize the, the Hebraic and the Torah context of it, there's a certain responsibility of us as males or us as men. And to man up is to remember the three annual feasts of Yahweh, our Elohim, our God. These three annual feasts where it says all the males of Israel are to appear before Yahweh Eloheinu, that we are to appear before Jah, our God. Now this is very important when we're speaking about man up. We have to man up to the covenant, the Kalakidan. We have to man up to our once lost but now found identity as Beta Israel, as Falashes of the West, as Ethiopian Hebrews. We have to man up to our true identity and also have to man up to who we are and how we got here and to recognize that, yes, the white man, the Gentiles, have treated us evilly in this land that's not our own, but also to recognize that we got into this situation because in ancient times we did not man up to the terms and the conditions of the al Kidan. And this does not disclude our women, our daughters, our mothers, our wives. But this points the focus once again squarely on the black man. And whether we go back to the Ganetta Aiden, we go back to the Garden of Eden, it was Eve who was what deceived. In fact, let's let's continue right here because we had left off on a message, beginning a message on sisterhood, and then our recording, previous recording, had actually um, um, ended there kind of abruptly. So now let's just continue in verse 9. It says, in like manner also. So after Hawari Apollos points out and he singles out the males. He, he's not saying men in the generic sense, but in the specific sense, he is saying the males. The males. In the same sense and the same context. Take this down, my brothers and sisters. Perhaps you all might have... Um, forgotten this or might not have been familiar with this, what Hawari Apollos, what the Apostle Paul is saying in First uh, Timothy chapter, chapter 2 at verse 8 is one and the same with what we find in Torah concerning the three annual feast of Yahweh Eloheinu. And we had done a, a, a teaching on this where we touched on this, but let's just um, give you the reference for this because it's important to compare, to compare and to contrast 
these um, two verses right here. It says um, in uh, Exodus chapter 23, there are three national feasts. There's the unleavened bread, there's first fruits, and there's in gathering. The season, the reason for this season that we're in now with Yom Teruah, with the Rosh Hashanah, with uh, the ten days of or the Yamim uh, Noraim, leading up to Friday, or what's the October 7th, sunset October 7th, to nightfall October 8th, is the Yom Kippur. The Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, of at one So this is the third of the three national uh, feast and it says right here in Ezekiel in, in Exodus you could have taught Exodus chapter 23 Exodus 23 and 14 it says three times three times shalt thou shalt keep a feast to me in the year that we should keep a feast to Yahweh at Loheno thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I command thee, in the time appointed in the month of Abib, or Aviv, for in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. Then it goes on to verse 16, And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year. So this is the time of ingathering after um, Yom Kippur, which is coming up in this 2011 um, Friday to Saturday, within, between Friday and Sunday. It's, it's within that time, sundown, Friday. So it's extra, especially holy. And seeing that next year is 2012, and we do not have to regurgitate all the 2012 predictions, prophecies, and speculations. But to see that this holy day, the day of atonement, is coinciding with a Shabbat day in the very same year that we have the King Sabbath of the Metaph Caduce, the line of Judah's um, Book of the Seven Seals, the Amharic Bible of His Imperial Majesty, that all of this is coinciding this year. So those who have eyes to see and who are spiritually attuned should be able to receive the, 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 the holiness, the, the sacredness, and the specialness. And it's also a preparation for the times of tribulation that we are in, but the escalation of these times of tribulation. Now, here it says that the Feast of Ingathering, which now after Yom Kippur, the Feast of Ingathering is five days. Five days after Yom Kippur is Tabernacles. The, the Feast of Ingathering is also known as Tabernacles, or in the Hebrew, Sukkot. It's known as the Sukkot, and, um, or booths. It's translated as booths, right? And it says, which is in the end of the year. So now we recognize that this is the end of our holy Hebraic year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Now here's the key that compares with... Um, the epistle of Paul to Timothy in chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 8, where he says, I will therefore that men, more specifically the males, pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, or bamarinya, alekutana, alekufu asab, without wrath and without evil. Thought. So evil thought or evil thinking or the evil mind is synonymous with doubting. And I think it's in the, the wisdom of Sirach, the wisdom of Sirach, one of the apocryphal books. It states that um, doubt is the daughter of Satan. Curse be he and curse be all of them. That, that doubt is the daughter of the devil, 
This is very interesting. So when one is messing with doubt, it's like messing around with the devil's daughter, in other words, according to the wisdom of our ancients. So it says that the men or the males should pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, compare that with Exodus 23 and 17, where it says, three times in the year, all thy males, thy males. So in King James it says men, but if we were to look at the, the Ethiopic and look at the original, it's specifically pointing out the males. So this is manning up, recognizing what, who we are and what our covenant responsibility is. Because if we do not keep the covenant as our people have not over the past 400 plus years, we experience the conditions, the situations, the trials and tribulations that we have gone through as a curse. These things that black people in the Americas and the Caribbean experience is a curse for disobedience and violation of the holy covenant of Yahweh, our Elohim, or of Jah, if you please, the God of Israel, because that's who we are. Now, it says three times in the year, in the year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord God, shall appear before Adonai Yahweh. So three times in the year. So it's pointing out the responsibility. This is the especial responsibility, brothers, of I and I. This is I and I responsibility. And it's not, just I, it's not just our responsibility for us, but it's our responsibility as, as the head. And if the head is sick, the whole body will be sick. So in our way of looking at this so-called secular idea of manning up and converting it from the secular to the spiritual, you understand, to the iritical, as we would say, we see that manning up means first of all we have to recognize who we are and what our responsibility is. And in other words, to, re to return. So the Yom Kippur is the time of repentance, you understand, a time of reflection, introspection, confession, and repentance and forgiveness. It's, it's, it's a very key time. It's, it's a very Im important um, season. So the reason for the season now, sisters, you all are not forgotten about, mothers, daughters, wives, um, sisters, you all are not forgotten about because now Huari Apalos, he says in, in verse 9, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, he says, in like manner also. So in the same manner, in other words, in the same way also, it says that that woman adorn themselves in modest apparel, in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or coarsely arrayed, verse 10, but in parentheses it says, which becometh woman professing godliness with good works, with good works. Now let's understand verse 9 and 10 by Morinia. Let's go to the Met of Kedus of Negus and Negest. And here it reads, In di hum degmo se torture be miga ba lips, ka if retina rasa chuena ka megazatagar, so natachuena ye shellemu. Egziavi herena in a feralen, le mia loot se torch in the miga ba, melkam be madregenji. Be Shurubana, be work, woim, be inukwe, woim, wagawa, ijiga, be kabre, lipsa, aya, shalemu. Now, how do we understand this, and, and, and how are we to understand this in this, in this particular, in this present time? Now, let's go over this, because it's very important, and we was actually where we left off in the previous part of this particular um, um, lecture or reasoning, um, we were speaking about Tavis Smiley's 
show from uh, this week, I think October 6th, October 5th, the Wednesday into Thursday. So you could probably go to the go to his website um, or go to rather the PBS website under Tavis, um, and you might be able to see the show where. I forget the sister's name, the African, West African sister's name, um, but she wrote a book, and the book is called um, um, Mighty Be Thy Power, and um, it's concerning the struggles that the Liberian people, and, and the woman in particular, how the woman played such a central role in helping the nation to overcome this terrible time, and they have Muslims and Christians, and how the Muslim and the Christian woman who are the, you can say the victims of it, when their husband, their sons, their brothers um, go out to war or are killed or are slain, they are left trying to, trying to keep the, the family together when the men are, are sacrificed in these senseless um, secular conflict over material things and the deceptions of Lucifer and the devil. Anyway, the important thing in the interview, and you have to check it out for yourself because I might not do complete justice to it, but here's what we picked up that connects with this particular reading right here. She was saying that though there's Christians and there are Muslims, um, African, West African, um, Liberian, um, woman, and they came together, and they had a lot of different differences amongst them. So they were trying to, first of all, ground this together, since they all experienced it, even though they have a difference of religion, whether Christian or whether Muslim. And one thing you'll find about African people, almost regardless of whatever so-called religion t that they tend to be in, they tend to really approach it spiritually for what the religion is. They tend to be you could say the, the, the best worshipers, you understand, the truest believers in whatever religion they happen to, to be in. So the women came together and they were able to unify themselves, first of all, around prayer. That, that prayer, that they would pray together, that they would pray a Christian prayer and they would pray a Muslim prayer. But also the dress was so very important that they originally wanted to wear sackcloth. So they decided to wear white. The, the, the sister on the interview with Tavis Smiley said that they decided to wear white. And they decided also to, to cover their heads, to cover their hair, and to cover their heads. And with the prayer, with the, 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 the white robes, and now the Bible teaches us, see, the, the white robes for them was to be similar to the sackcloth. And they said they couldn't find actual sackcloth. They decided on the, the white garments. And they decided also to cover their, you know, to cover their heads and to pray. And this helped them to create a sisterhood amongst themselves. Because instead of, like, the secular women who are all caught up on a bunch of nonsense, devilish, and satanistic vanities, you know, like, um, like crabs in the barrel, you know what I'm saying, on, on material vanity, how I look, how you look, what clothes you got on, what clothes I got on. They were able to bring righteousness by, first of all, having prayer as the most important thing, and then their, 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 their robe and their attire. And this gathering seems to be led by the, by more so by the Christian um, woman in that particular community, but still, when we heard that, and then we got into this particular, the, the Holy Spirit led us to this particular message and teaching, seeing that Yom Kippur is a time of intensive, of intensive prayer, of intensive self-examination, of, of, of confession, of forgiveness, of fasting. Because when you understand the importance of Yom Teruah, that is announcing judgment. Then there are these ten days. And then at the end of the ten days come Yom Kippur, where one's fate for the coming year, the Almighty inscribes into a book. So we're working out our spiritual accounts in this particular time. So 
seeing that prayer is so vital and so uh, uh, such a central aspect for the individual as well as for the community, we felt that it was necessary for us to begin off saying, first of all, as Huari Apollos Paul taught here, that to I exhort, therefore, he says that first he advises, in Mekaralu, he says, I, I advise, therefore, that first of all, before anything else, first and foremostly, and we, this is why we wrote this up here, that, that prayer, that, that first of all, supplications, limina, that prayers, salot, that intercessions, milja, and that the giving of thanks, misgana, be made for all men. And now men in this sense is different than men in the sense of verse 8. Men in the sense of verse 8 is speaking particularly to the males. Men in the sense of verse 1 is speaking to all people. So we have to understand that, that it's speaking to all people. And it says for kings and for all that are in authority, that we, I and I and I, may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness, resembling God, resembling the King of Kings and his Christ, and honesty or chimitinet, gravity, seriousness. Now, if you look at the condition and the state of this, this world, we do not see people living quietly and at peace, and, and resembling godliness, resembling God. That's what godliness means, resembling God and, and honesty or chmitinet or with gravity or with seriousness. And the key reason is that people pray selfishly and they expect to be given something for that. They, they pray with wrath and with malice, and they expect to receive. It reminds me of what Hawariya Ya'iko, what, what, what uh, Hawariya Ya'iko says, or James says in chapter 4 of his epistle, and it's a rebuke of worldliness, James chapter 4. And he says, from whence comes wars? From where? Kit. From where comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even from your lust, even from the lust, that war in your members, the desires, the ungodly desires, that war in one's members? Ye lust. And have not that the, the more that they lust or desire to have, still they, they, they feel a lack. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, and we're in a time of almost unprecedented warfare, fighting, bloodshed, murder, and mayhem in this present time. Yet ye have not because ye ask not. And then it goes on in verse 3 to say, ye ask, y'all ask, and y'all don't receive. Y'all receive not. Y'all can't kabbala it. Y'all can't kabbala it. Y'all can't receive. Why is this? Hawariya ya'iko. Because ye ask amiss. Because you ask in error. You ask amiss. And not from the mister. You, not from Adonai and not according to Adonai's um, way but you act wrongly or improperly is the central theme and the central idea, or in, in the brackets, the marginal, it is, there's, there's an I next to it, and it says evilly. Ye acts amiss. Ye acts evilly. Ye acts evilly with with kutta, with, with, with wrath, and with kufuasab, and with an evil mind, evil thoughts. Hmm? that ye may consume it upon your lust, that you may consume it on your desires. And see, we're living in a time where the media and, 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 and the whole current, the, the whole imagination of this generation is almost the very same way that it was in the time of Noah, in the time of Noah. We're in an 
evil time of evil imagination, of evil thoughts and desires and lust. And it says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. So it's non-partial. The adulterers, the male, and the adulteresses. Non non-partial. The true God, the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is not a sexist. He says, you adulterers and you adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity, is hatred with God? So if you try to be a friend of the world, you are an enemy to the true God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you try to be a friend of the world, but if you look around and listen and, and see what's going on, this is exactly where the, the current of, of thought is to be a friend of the world, to save the world. Be a, I like the world, everybody, and, and this is madness. This is seriously madness. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Can you imagine that all these people are trying to be a friend of the world, of the seclorum, that they are enemies, that God in heaven views them as enemies? Yet the Almighty is patient, is merciful, as it says elsewhere, that he's not willing, he is not willing that any, that any should perish but that all should come to salvation. He, he, he's not willing. He, he doesn't want ones to perish, but he wants ones to be saved. So he, he winks at these, at these times. He, he, he allows it, but not because he approves of it, but in hopes that ones will, will hear and will heed, you know what I'm saying, will heed the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ before it's too late. But Hawadi Ya'ekob, just a little bit more from Ya'ekob, he says, do you think, do you think, first of all, do you think, and now secondly, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God, Jah, resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, to Jah. Resist Diablos, the liar, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to Jah, draw nigh to Yahweh, to Eloheinu, to Hashem, Baruchu, and he will draw nigh, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. See, we're, we're, we're in Timothy. He's speaking, Timothy, the other apostle, is speaking, saying, I will therefore that males, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And then it goes on in verse 9, in like manner also concerning the woman as well. So this is a message to clean our hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This is why people can't give you a straight answer on matters of evil you know, or good or evil. They're like, I don't know. You know, they, 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 they avoid answering it. They can, they can see so-called both sides of it because they are double-minded. And this is, this is the heart condition. Now, here's the key thing that connects now in Yaakov with this upcoming, with this upcoming um, fast and this upcoming day known as Yom Kippur. When we look at James, Yaakov chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. This is exactly the mindset for Yom Kippur. Be afflicted, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of Adonai, and he will lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Speak not evil one of another. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law, speaketh evil of Torah, of the word of Jah, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge, there is one law giver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgeth another? Now, let's understand this. 
when it says, who art thou that judges another? If John say this is wrong, well, that's wrong. All you have to do is say, John say that's wrong, but it's, 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 it's not on you as though you are the judge and executioner. You understand? There is one who is the lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. And that's what this time of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is all about. So who art thou that, that judgeth another? Go to now, ye that say tomorrow or to today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. You hear people talking about that all the time, right? Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor, or in the Hebrew is hevel, hevel or hebel, like Abel, Abel. It is a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, if Adonai will, Gita be fekid, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicings, rejoicing is evil. Can you imagine? All such kind of vain rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. To him it accounts before Yahweh as sin. So if one say, well, Yom Kippur, I'm basically a good guy. I don't do anything really wrong like the other guy over there. Then you're not looking at it rightly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if you look at it honestly, you will see something in your nature or in yourself or in your heart or in your mind that you should repent of and that you should, as it says right here, it says, it says very clearly, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now let's return. Let's return to where we're at right here, speaking to the sisters. But this is still connected as a message to the brothers, to the men, the wendoch, and to the sisters, the seitoch, concerning this moedim or um, concerning this um, holy day and, and this particular time and, and this particular season that we are in. The scriptures teach us that the end of a thing is more blessed than the beginning of a thing. And this is the end of the year. This is the end of this cycle and the beginning of a new cycle. And this new cycle and this new year is going into what has been predicted and prophesied to be a very perilous time. And we can already see signs of how perilous this time is and is becoming because it's not lessening. It's increasing with madness, just mod. People are mod, and it's chaotic. And there's no sense of, of truth. Truth has almost perished from amongst the sons of men. But for the sisters, when it's saying to the sisters, and, and my, my point a little bit earlier concerning the sisterhood or concerning that the Tavis Smiley show with the African sister who pointed out that in their group they had some, a lot of differences amongst them, but once they put prayer being first and foremost, and once they, they adorn themselves in, 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 the, in the garment of righteousness, the white robes and the white linen the white garments, the clean white garments is known scripturally as it's like washing our garments in the blood of the Lamb and wearing the garment of righteousness and covering their heads as well. Therefore, covering up whether, whether they're, they're broided here, they're braided here, they're gold, they're costly pearls, not, not, not being show-off show off itches show off witches, not being not getting involved in that. That 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 um that has destroyed the 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 sisterhood. Because when you look among black women, there is very few examples of, of true sisterhood. This is one thing that is sorely lacking. 
And I say to the brothers, we have to man up, as we've been speaking on, man up to recognize, first of all, whose image are we and have we been created in? And whose image? When we recognize that we've been created in the image of the God and Father, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. This is the first step of knowing ourselves. And when we can set that, when we can humble ourselves before the true God and King of the entire universe, heaven and earth and the sea, then our sisters, our daughters, our mothers, our wives, by and large, there may be a few that, like it says, that fall from grace, but by and large, they will get their acts together too. So instead of saying to the sisters, y'all better get your act together and look how these women are, so forth and so on, we brothers have to man up and recognize the true standard. The true standard for us is our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the glory of the King of Kings, to the glory of Ketamawi Hala Selassie. You better recognize before it's too late. Now, as it goes forward, it says that let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. That I, I know there's a lot of sisters who get this twisted, but sister, sister, can, can, can you read uh, Greek? Hebrew, have you studied the language, to really understand the context of what's being said? Or are you just getting twisted around your ignorance? Because a lot of sisters, they read this and they say, oh, women learn in silence of all subjection. I am liberated. You only liberate as long as the white man has been allowed to carry on in his, in his, um, in his uh, iniquitous excesses because we have fallen from our righteousness. You know what I mean? In the times of the Gentiles, really. You know, you're not liberated from nothing. This is all part of how to make a slave. It already said reverse the roles between the males and the females. So you have black men and, and black women living like, like animals, living in the image of the beast, trying to live up to white man and white woman standards. And white men and white women don't know if they want to be white men and white women or white woman and white men. So, so therefore, this confusion, the confusion is like the hate that hate produced, in other words. But here's what the word says. It says, but I suffer not a woman to teach. In other words, remember the context of it. It is speaking to the window, to the males. Hawari Apollos is speaking to the disciple Timothy. You understand? It's speaking concerning the men. He said, I suffer not a woman, in other words, to teach the males. And, and so you have to understand this in, in, in a very key way. This is not talking about a righteous mother teaching her son. You understand? Because the son is, 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 is not a man. He's, he's still a little boy. And a righteous woman, of course, a righteous mother, that's her first duty. As it says in Proverbs 1 and 8, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. So, see, a lot of folks read one little thing over here and get it twisted. Because remember what we said earlier. Ignorance was the original sin. It wasn't an apple. It wasn't so much sex. It was ignorance. It was disobedience. You see, the Almighty regards, um, uh, well, this is that as, as, as a sin of witchcraft. Disobedience is like the sin of witchcraft. You understand? Not heeding to God's righteous will and command is like you commit witchcraft. And you don't have to draw no little diagrams on the ground and, and sprinkle powder or whatever. It's the same as that. And that's what it is in essence. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp, to usurp. We're living in a time where, where authority has been usurped, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, if you look at the Schofield Study Bible, this is before some of y'all get like, oh, I ain't going to listen to this, but just listen to this for a moment, if you will. The, the, the silence here, in both cases, it means a quietness. You see, sisters, daughters, mothers, wives, that quietness of spirit, maybe they'll come out on one of these doctor shows or in the news and say that women that have humble, quiet spirit, even in times of tribulation, so forth and so on, it does their health much better. You understand? This is, this is what it's speaking about. It's speaking about this quietness, not in a sense of like somebody is dominating you or subjugation because 
he, we, we must recall, as it says a little bit earlier up here, it says that he has not given us, he has not given us, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound and a healthy and a healthy mind. All this agitation that you see among on these shows and TV and out in the world, it's just killing the people. They're just killing themselves. It's another trick of the devil. It's another trick of the enemy. It's just killing themselves. You, you know what I mean? And what they're going through, it doesn't even warrant these kind of wild and angry and, and irrational and bestial animalistic responses. All you're doing is you are killing yourself. By, when you see this happening, People are becoming possessed by even pushing their spirits like that. Now, the reason why Hawaii Apollos is saying it is because there's another mystery connected. As we go to verse 13, it says, For Adam was first formed, rather he was first reformed, and then Eve. See, people think that, well, Adam was made first. No. In the beginning, Man was made in the image and after like, remember Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, there's a difference there. There's some time difference. There's some events that are not spoken about in Moses' um, rendition to us from the wisdom of ancient Egypt. But there's a difference between the man that was created in Genesis 1 and the Adam and Eve of Genesis 2. When it says that, and Adam was first formed, you have to understand this in the sense that Adam was first reformed. He was first reformed. And then Eve. In other words, it's like what we're saying right here, sons, brothers, husbands, fathers. We have to get our act together before we even say hey or nay or yay to the, to the sisters, the mothers, the daughters, and the wives. This, plain, this is God's order. We've tried it every other way. Let us try it Yah's way. Since we've been trying to do it every other way, we tried civil rights, affirmative action, all kind of stuff. It hasn't worked. Let's do it Yah's way. Verse 14 says, and Adam was not deceived. No, Adam, Adam was not deceived. Now, some of the men would be like, maybe they're nudging their wives or something like that, or their, or their sisters. See, I told you, Adam wasn't deceived. No, Adam wasn't deceived. Adam disobeyed willingly. Adam was a willful violator. And basically, I'm speaking of us, brothers. Adam wasn't tricked. Adam, <laughs> Eve was deceived. A trick was done on her. She was not, in other words, protected, we can say. And, and she was tricked. She was deceived. We can say, in a certain sense, she was raped spiritually. Adam went along with it. That's why, see, when the Bible says, see, a lot of, a lot of um, counterfeit Christians and whitewashed Christians and, 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 nigger, and nigger preacher and nigger pastors, they have used this to beat the woman over the head. See, Adam was not deceived, but they have not understood the mystery. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam was cursed. You see what I'm saying? The woman was in transgression. She was in... Uh, it's like she, she, she violated because she was deceived. She was tricked. Transgression. You have to understand. But Adam, the real sin now was on Adam because Adam was not tricked. Into, Adam knew better. The nigger knew better, and the nigger tried to blame who? See, here's where the black man became a nigger. The black man didn't become a nigger in slavery. The black man actually became a nigger in the Ganetta Aden. You understand? When he went along with that, and then when Yahweh came through the, through the, when Adonai came walking through the garden in the cool of the eve, and, and Adam, Adam, where are you? And, and Adam, you know, when he finally answers, oh, um, um, I heard you and I was afraid. And he's like, why were you afraid? You know, have you eaten of that tree? Even the Almighty is trying to give him an opportunity to confess. Just like he's trying to give us an opportunity during this Yom Kippur time to do the very same thing, to confess. You know, to, to confess, to repent, to make amends. What did he say? He said, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me, and I did eat. So what did Adam do? What did that black man do? 
as a template for every fallen black man. He first of all blamed God. It's like he shook his fist against God. He blamed the king of kings. He blamed the king. He blamed Moshiach. You understand? He blamed, he blamed Christ. He blamed the master. He blamed the boss. And then he blamed his woman. He says, the woman, he says, the woman that you gave me. So he blamed both God and the woman. Excuse me, brothers and sisters, I just got to say, what a little bitch. Adam was, the, Adam was the bitch in that. Instead of him saying, I, my bad, my bad, he said, the woman that you gave me, can you imagine that? He said, the woman that you gave me, she gave me to eat, and I ate. Basically, he said, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. You want to t talk about an excuse-making Negro? You understand? This is Adam, and this is important for us to, to take the, 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 the blinders off our eyes and, 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 and take the film out of our eyes so that we can see clearly, as the Revelation says, to buy eye salve so that we can see. It says, notwithstanding, verse 15, she, speaking of the woman, safety too, she shall be saved in childbearing. Now, this is, now here's what some brothers not understanding this, and some sisters with the brothers who don't understand it very well, sometimes get it twisted. They say, well, well, by having children, I'm saved. Well, that's, that's a part of it. Actually, it is a part of it, according to the Almighty. Now, I know in this world we say, well, oh, we can't afford it, or this and that, so forth and so on, blah, 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 rare, rare, rare. And maybe at a certain point of ignorance, we cannot afford it when we are ignorant of who we are, what is the kalakidan, what is our relationship, what is our role and responsibility, who we are, who is our brother and sister, and what we really should be doing individually and collectively. Perhaps we cannot afford it in that sort of um, situation, but it's saying to the woman that notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, but look what comes after the comma. Read what comes after the comma. It says, if, if they, wait, if they, notice, have you noticed something? It says, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. If what? They. Not if she. It says, if they. Who's the they? It's saying, they must be Adam and Eve, like to say the male and the female. If they do what? If they continue. If they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. See, I heard some preachers preach this, and it sounded like, well, if the woman continues in um, faith, charity, holiness, and sobriety, you know, so it put the onus on a woman, you better continue and such and such, and you're going to be saved by having children, so on and so on. But it's really saying if they, if they, you know, if they continue. So this is a very important, this is a very important, let's just get this bummer in here. Let's see, it says, Neger again. So this is the reason why Satan seeks to destroy the black family. And we get a perfect, uh, a, a, a perfect glimpse of this, an uh, excellent glimpse of this, in How to Make a Slave, when you read How to Make a Slave, and when you study How to Make a Slave, it's like Satan and the Satanistic strategy, and we can go all the way back to the book of Hanok, the book of Enoch, with the fallen watches and, and, the, and, and the giants and the fallen angels. They did the very same thing, to destroy and to break up the family, and we can go through we can go through the whole history of humanity, and this has been the devil's strategy, you understand, know to break up and destroy the family, especially those families that have godly potential. This has been his strategy. And unfortunately, many of us have been ignorant, you understand, know and some of us have been disobedient. But here's the good news, that this is a time of atonement. 
This is an opportunity and a time, and, and regardless if one is already a Christian and they admit in the Moshiach and they say that Christ died one time for us all, so forth and so on, but he has not done away with his holy days. He has not done away with his, his, his calendar. And we can even see that the apostles, we can see that the disciples, and most of all, our master, Yeshua, Adonenu, Yehoshua, Jesus Christos, our black Lord and Savior himself, kept these as well. Kept these holy times, these holy seasons, because there's a reason for these seasons. You, you see what I'm saying? Um and we need to understand what the reason is for these for the season before it's too late. I mean, I mean, just 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 look at it. 2012. This is an opportunity now before 2012 to get our our heads and our hearts in order. So this is a very very crucial portion here. And I know there probably will be some questions, some um some 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 questions on this as there should be um, many questions on this particular area of Scripture. Even when it says that, um, let's go to verse uh, 13. Verse 13, where did, we, where, where did we leave off? We left off at so we're from verse um, 11 to uh, verse 15. It says, Sait the negr hulu iye tegezach be zigata temar. Sait again be zigata tenorinji. Litasa Tamura Woima but when the lie Lita Salatin Ala Fek Dim Adam Kedmo Tefet Rualina Bechwala Ma He Hewan Tefet Rech Yete Talalem Adam I Delen Yete Talalem Adam I Delen Sati Tu again te talla be metalale fa wedek ech negergin be imnetna be fikr be kedisna rasachuin yegezua binorua be mauled to denalech it's interesting how it goes from themselves both speaking of women in the collective sense but more importantly the couple more importantly, the family. More importantly, the, the Adam and the Hewan, the male and the female. This is so crucial, and this is probably one of the reasons why when we look at what we see in the world today um, happening um, with black women in particular, but with, with, with the, the, it seems like the whole woman, womankind, the woman gender, it's, 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 it's something for I and I to pray on, and um, there's more. There's more on this. We're, we're gonna meditate on this a, a little bit more, and um, stay tuned, my brothers and sisters. Shalom. Once again, Ras Teferi. <laughs>